Yes, this is the Crash MotoGP podcast, episode 17. It's the week building up to the British Grand Prix 2021 and MotoGP. Well, it's really given us uh, a lot of twists and turns in the tale of this season on and off track. Myself, Harry Benjamin, alongside Keith Hewin and Pete McLaren have got all the latest from the entire Vinales story so far to previewing this weekend's race at Silverstone. And it seems, gents, that... It wouldn't be a MotoGP podcast if we didn't start with Maverick Vinales once again making the headlines. A lot has changed in the week we've been off air. Of course, he was suspended by Yamaha for the uh, the second of the double headers in Austria. Then on the Monday after, it was officially announced he will be joining Aprilia for 2022. And to add to that, Yamaha have then said he will not be returning to the team for the rest of this season, which, of course, has had a huge knock on effect up and down the classes, which we'll come into. First off, Keith, your thoughts on Vinales, Aprilia. We sort of, you know, it was one of the teams that was speculated. He was running out of options, but he didn't really have many other places to go if he was going to go anywhere. No, there were no options at all for for Maverick, I've got to say. And um, I mean... (laughs) Sod's Law, we record it on a Sunday last week and it all happened on a Monday. Um, <laughs> yeah. Apologies, folks. Crash.net. We're normally, we're normally across all of this stuff, but unfortunately, I don't think anybody... Uh, the speculation was there that he was going to go to Aprilia. Uh, my question was, I think, last week was, who would have him, really, with the state of mind he seems to be in at the moment? And the question for me with, with Maverick is, who at Aprilia has got that kind of pastoral care? Who Who is the kind of person or persons at Aprilia that can look after a, a, a character like Maverick Vinales? I would say none of them. If we've seen, you know, Abessiano, uh, you know, the the original team tech guy as well, he he's quite harsh. They are quite harsh. Second riders at Aprilia have never fared very well. Ask Bradley Smith, ask, you know, Scott Redding. You know, you can, you can go back through Cal- – you can go back through a few that haven't fared very well up against Alasius Bargro. Uh, uh, I think where the where the key for Aprilia will be here, they can build a bike, they can get a bike to do that one or two laps that Alace needs to get him somewhere nice on the grid and can get him into the top half dozen if he really, really bites a screen and scratches as hard as any man can and Alace can. Will Maverick be prepared to do that? I can't see it with his frame of mind at the moment and I can't see, without a rest period, I can't see that frame of mind being sorted out. Um my question is, is is he going to come back and do some rides for Aprilia later on in the year? And how will that go? There, there can be nothing worse from a rider and a team point of view. If you've just got your new signing, he turns up, his head's gone, and he performs badly prior to the year that you want him to perform well. 2022, when we see all the upgrades come flooding back for all the other teams that have been on tech freezes and so on and so forth, enforced tech freezes. I... I'm stunned by the whole situation. And what about Davizioso? If you wanted a banker, Davizioso was the banker all along because he was still very, very fast and very, very consistent and a very, very clever man. He seemed to me to be a, a kind of natural fit if you could get him on side at Aprilia. Yamaha, we said last week again that the, the big factory was on holiday, Japanese holiday, at that particular point. You knew there would be lots of intercompany emails flying around between each other, between Europe and, and the Japanese. And, and sure enough, you know, what was expected? Why would you keep him? Why would you, why would you give him any more information? Why would you give him a free pass to, to take any information across to Aprilia? You know, he's on the inside of a factory Yamaha team. There's nothing that, that Yamaha want to give away to Aprilia automatically with a rider who's leaving them anyway. So the, the, the fact that he got fired out there and they agreed to to, to disagree and, and part company. That that for me was a was a completely natural situation. I couldn't see it ending any other way with Yamaha. Um, are Yamaha to blame in some respect? There's always got to be some managerial blame, if you ask me, uh, regarding a rider's state of mind. Um, is Maverick Vinales too difficult to work with? I wouldn't have said so. He does have a problem. Um, and it's one that, for me, needed a bit more time. Hopefully, Aprilia recognise that and don't get him on the bike too early and don't heap too much expectation on him too early. There's no doubt about it. Maverick Vinales is a MotoGP, a Grand Prix winner in the toughest time there's ever been to ride a MotoGP bike, any Premier class. 
uh, any year, this is the hardest it's ever been to win a Grand Prix because there's so many bikes and so many blokes capable of doing it. So anybody that can do it, like Mario Vinales, is a bit special. And I think that, that recognising that and getting him onside at Aprilia and giving him a motorbike that works, th this is going to be key. We've seen it before. We can do we can do the Joan Zarco uh, thing, if you like, and I don't rate Zarco as highly as I do Maverick Vinales as a rider. Sorry about that, but I don't. Um, and when he went to KTM, couldn't make it work. Everyone else had to, had to try and work that front end out. And if the same thing happens to Maverick at Aprilia, he can't get around it. The bike doesn't suit him. There's something not quite right. It could be career ending. It's bringing up a lot of questions, isn't it? But Pete, let's bring you in on this as well now, because as Keith alluded to, you know, this Aprilia machine has yet to break the top five in race results either. It's the only manufacturer on the grid without a podium or a victory in the MotoGP era. But now that he is no longer coming back to Yamaha for the rest of the year, with Lorenzo Savadori as well uh, on the sidelines temporarily, could could a switch happen straight away, or do you think it's going to see out to the end of the season and as well to cover off what Keith said Davizioso this looks like it's the end of the road for him in terms of a comeback uh, let's do Savadori <laughs> have first. all of that at once <laughs> go <laughs> Savadori I think it's uh, a few messages with Aprilia this morning it sounds quite positive that he might ride this weekend so that's good news about his ankle so that would suggest that yeah there's going to be no instant changes okay. anyway um, there is a test coming up they've got booked for the end of this month it's been booked for Dobby They've had it sort of planned for a while now. And that seems to be when people think that Maverick might ride the Aprilia for the first time. So as, as Keith says, you, you know, it's that you want him on the bike, but you don't want to put too much pressure. But of course, they will want to know if there is any major issue he has with the bike. It's better to know sooner rather than later. That gives them more time to sort of try and address it for next season, doesn't it? So I think that, that that's what we'll see, that, that Maverick will he'll ride a test before anything else. And then the question is, will he come in and do some races, maybe as a wild card? I probably haven't used any of their wild cards yet. They've got six available. Um, there's some talk, you know, there's a bit of a procedural thing where you should you should um, make the wild card entry something like two or three months before the race, and that wouldn't be possible now with you know the lack of time. But other than that, I think it, it could be done. There's also talk that if not, he could just replace Savador. You know that Savador could maybe step back to his testing role and Maverick would finish the year as a replacement because he no longer has the Yamaha contract. So there's a few options available if they want to get Maverick to do a few races this year. And I, I, I think it's more likely than not that we'll see him race at some stage just so that they can get a bit of, of information on, on how he feels about the bike in a race weekend. It's a bit like what we saw with Pedroza. Testing is one thing, but until you actually go into that race environment, you're not going to know for sure. So, and, and one of the complaints that the Aprilia riders have had is that they've been a little bit late in, in debuting the new bike each year, and then they've never really caught up. So I think they will want to get some early early progress in on that. And then let's see. Dovi, I mean, Dovi, I, it's all gone quiet with Dovi, but actually I think he seems like he's still in play with Yamaha. Now, <laughs> Dovi isn't one that, that does speculation. So the fact it's gone quiet with some riders, that would be a really bad thing. It would mean nothing's happening. But, but Dovi doesn't speculate. You know, he's just not, that's not in his character. So you don't hear about things until they're done. And his name, you know, we've spoken months ago that he was being linked with Yamaha. We, we heard, you know, and I was told his priority is to race next year. Now, there's still some Yamaha seats available for next year. And, you know, Patronus, or, well, it's not going to be Patronus. Sepang, presumably it's not going to be called Sepang, whatever the team will be called. And we should know this weekend. I think this weekend is when the team are going to announce their future plans. You know, presumably they'll, they'll announce some of their riders as well for next year. So yeah, it sounds like Dobby's certainly in play there. Um, you know, you know, it, it will depend on a lot of factors as always. It depends on what a new title sponsor wants, who, who they found. I mean, we know the team wants the young rider. We, we've heard Darren Binder is, is hotly linked with one of the mm. seats. Now, could it be that maybe they're, they're now erring towards the other side with an experienced rider for that second seat? The other question with Dovi is, of course, we've got Cal coming in this weekend to replace Vinales. But what's happening after this weekend? We don't really know. The situation in the team's championship is quite, quite close in that Yamaha have a 37-point advantage. But if they only have Quattararo, that's going to get chipped away to Ducati pretty quickly. So they need a second rider that can come in and score points. 
Now, Cal can, can you know, score points and chip away. But as, as he said, do I want to race? Do I want to do 12 races or, or, sorry, 10 races if you count the two he's already done? He's also supposed to be developing the 2022 bike for Yamaha. So if Yamaha want him to go to Japan and do some testing, how will he do that if he's got a full race schedule? There's all the, of these factors. Could, could Dovi then be an option there? You know, you're even hearing about could Morbidelli move early? But then you have, if Morbidelli went to the factory team, that would be the team's title. You'd have to think safe. But I think there's things in the rules that stop riders switching teams in that way and replacing riders because you've got the engine allocation. So Frankie's on the 2019 bike. Now, the factory team have the 2021 bike. You can't just, you know, jump across mid-season. So all of these things can be done if you have agreement from all of the other manufacturers and everything else in the Grand Prix Commission. It's like everything. So it comes down to, you know, what, what are your friends like? You know, have you, you know, what do the other manufacturers think of you at the moment, if you like? Have you, you know, have you been getting on with them well or, or whatever? But yeah, there's a lot. We used to say, didn't we, that, that MotoGP, everything happened on the track. And then, you know, in between the racing, it all went quiet. And F1 was the opposite. Nothing used to happen on the track. And then it was all of the backroom deals and everything. It seems like, you know, this year, MotoGP, it's, it's as, much, as much action off the track as it is on it. The one thing you can be fairly sure of, Yamaha are not in kind of the position politically among the teams that some of the other teams are amongst you. If you remember, you know, the big row about the Ducati aero was it an error? Was it a tire calling tool? The scoop on the back wheel. Everybody got into Ducati over that particular obvious aero piece, except Yamaha. Yamaha didn't get involved in that. So Yamaha, you know, don't have quite as many enemies on the old uh, manufacturers' association, perhaps as as some of the others. I mean, Aprilia, if you remember, were very, very vociferous about it. The new, the new Formula One guy that came in. Ha, See, that's exactly backs up what Pete said a minute ago. As soon as you get a Formula One bloke involved, <laughs> it all kicks off when it comes to the rule book. And the wonderful thing about the, the rule book in MotoGP is it's thin. It's not a very detailed book. It has room for interpretation. Now, that's a good thing in some respects and a damn awful one in others um, because you can never be too – I mean, it's, it's manna from heaven for the likes of Gigi Delinia that works his way around every single page that there is in the book to, to make something extra for Ducati. And, of course, that's up the game of so many other people as well. I mean, plagiarism is the best form of flattery, I'm told. I don't know whether engineers feel the same way about that. But, if you, you know, Yamaha actually had that scoop before anybody else. It was a, a, a rain deflector to deflect the rain that was coming down the bodywork away from the rear wheel, from going under the rear wheel. But they hadn't actually considered it as aero. Aero was a, was a, was a later development. And that's what I... I love about prototype series like MotoGP. I mean, you keep coming up with these innovations. And uh, like I say, with a thin rule book, it gives us an option to still look at all this sort of stuff. But Pete's dead right. They've got to agree it amongst all the manufacturers before it is allowed. Um, mm. Dorna are brilliant in that they will change rules and they will twist the arm of every manufacturer for something they want. Look at the old ECU inertial platform twist that Honda had to give up a clear advantage that they had electronically over everyone else. The, the electronics that they had on, on, on Marquez's bike was so sophisticated. That's what really helped that motorcycle work well. When it went to the spec ECU and the spec inertial platform, it was never the same motorbike since. It was only because Marquez was so damn good on it and could ride a, a you know, garden gate um, well that it ended up where it did. But, I don't know. There's a lot to be – I mean, I'm, I'm really looking forward. For the first time, I hate rule. I, I don't normally look at the rule book or anything along those lines because as an ex-rider, you just oh, don't want to – I haven't got room in my head for all this stuff. I want to leave it to other people. But I'm actually looking forward to 2022 to see what comes up, to see what – you know, now this, this freeze allegedly will be over. I mean, maybe they'll extend it. I don't know. They might even extend it into next year. I mean, you've got to say that it's not just Dorner who must be feeling the pinch financially. I mean, you imagine what their their balance sheet looks like at the moment. It must be horrendous. They pumped so much extra money in it to keep this series going. Same for the teams. You know, the extra administrative uh, manpower that they need to make things work. I mean, I had a conversation with a, a friend of mine the other day. She looks after, obviously, uh, moving people around the world um, to cover uh, MotoGP absolutely incredible amounts of extra work in not not extra extra work but enormous amounts of it 
to actually make it work with flights being cancelled last minute as airlines decide that it's not profitable so they drop off the edge and suddenly you can't get a flight um I mean, she's even booking stuff late on nowadays, whereas it used to be booked a year in advance for, for most flights to places. But if you do that, you're just basically wasting your time. It's it's, it's not going to happen. Um, I don't know about you, Pete, but I've I've had flights booked into Southeast Asia um, for nearly a year for this October, November. I've just let them go because every every morning I wake up and a flight is cancelled. And a connecting flight is still there, but the flight that joins with it isn't there anymore. And then you try and hook up with another airline and another. And in the end, you think to yourself, do I really need to go overseas? Do I, you know, I might just spend another winter and have Christmas at home again here in the UK. Um, and work that out, compound that through the paddock. What an, a logistical nightmare for everybody concerned. I mean, You've got the Brexit factor that, that, you know, some journos, particularly photographers and Matt Oxley, of course, is kicking off about left, right and centre as he does because he's a little bit on the left hand side of things and, and, and hates the very thought of Brexit and so on and so forth. So every time there's something negative to print about it, Matt's across it. Bloody good journalist on motorbikes, by the way, but he obviously leans a bit that way. So, uh, so Brexit is like this, this particular deal that he absolutely hates. So if you want to find anything negative about Brexit, <laughs> go and have a look on Matt's timeline. Um, but quite rightly, he's pointed out some real hardships for people to cover the British Grand Prix, not just when you get here, which is a nightmare anyway, from Wednesday onwards when Silverstone is locked down into a red zone and nobody can move into or around mm. anything to do with the the core issues, the core core side of MotoGP, Moto3 and Moto2. Um, but just bringing cameras in, you've got to have proper, not quite carnets, but you've got to have the same thing. Anybody Does anybody remember carnets out there? Probably not old enough to remember that. My birthday today, by the way, so I remember it really well. Happy birthday, I'm, Keith. 21 happy again. Birthday. I'm worth twice as much now because relics are quite, quite hard to come across. <laughs> This will be the last podcast now because you've bankrupted us. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I got a birthday card chipped in stone, which uh, <laughs> kind of suits me. But, you know, it, I remember Carnets. I remember when Europe was all individual states and you every time you travelled to a border to go from here to France, border, different currency. We weren't on Euros then either. We were on a different currency, so we were doing the old French franc. Then you would go from there across into Germany, another border, Deutschmark, then you go another border into Austria, Schilling, not one of ours, one of theirs, and and a border again. And if you went into Italy, oh, mate, honestly, take plenty of stickers and plenty of caps because it's the only way that you get through borders was with stickers and caps. If you were going into Spain, which is ironic, really, when you consider that it's the Spanish that run the entire sport nowadays out of Dorna in uh, Catalan and Catalonia. Um, if you went into Spain, you, you could never go through the Barcelona border or something like that if you're coming in from France. What you had to do was go up into the mountains, go through Andorra or somewhere, and sneak through the one-man post with the little swingy gate thing and sneak your van through that way, really, to, to get into the country. Because if you went and used your carne, a carne, by the way, for anybody, again, I'm sorry if I'm boring you with this, if you know what I'm talking about, but a carne was basically a, 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 a folder full of sheets of paper like this, like in triplicate for each one. And every nut, bolt, washer, O-ring, anything, tiniest things, your tools, everything had to be in this carnet, individually marked up in how many numbers there were in it. And when you went into a country, if they were being awkward, they would check every drawer. You imagine how much shit you got on board a van going into it. Anyway, they would check every, if they were really being awkward with you. Worst place to be was in pole position at a border because you were the one that they were going to pick on. So what you used to do is you used to hang back and let Parrish go first to somebody uh, and let them get all the crap when he got there. But then comes the other thing. You use up consumables during the course of the weekend, and you had to mark that off as a used part, but it still had to be part of the carne. So when you come out of the border, if they decided to, to drag all your bits and pieces out all over the tarmac, they would then look at the secondhand part that came out of of the bike you couldn't throw it in a bin you had to then mark it off you imagine what that was like luckily the system was so bloody inefficient and, and then everybody at every border was so bribable <laughs> that it, it never caused a problem but because europe pretty much hates us now um it's always going to be a problem in and out of britain for the next for the foreseeable future 
because every time they are going to make you tick a box. Uh, and it's going to be for those that thought this was going to be an easy transition. A, you're an idiot. B, even whichever way you voted, whether you voted to, to stay or to go, if anybody thought um, leaving the European Union was going to be an easy transition, I don't know what planet you come from, but it was never going to happen easily. Now, there are some that believe that in five or 10 years time, we will benefit from that. But of course, there are lots, probably the majority, who thought come January the 31st or whatever it was, oh, we're out of Europe, we're going to have a wonderful time and everybody's going to... No, we're not. We're going to have a shit time for about five years and then it'll all get better. Have I depressed everybody? <laughs> well, I mean, a thoroughly enjoyable history lesson, I think, if nothing else. Yeah, but <laughs> if I try and... All you got to remember, Harry, is take a hat. <laughs> give, your, yeah. give your hat to, that's my, my shilling, only piece shillings for Austria school. yeah <laughs> a bit of old school um, advice take a hat and a load of stickers stickers are out of fashion nowadays well yeah well and um, well yeah I mean I, I think they're coming they back are in fashion or okay fair yeah, right. might, yeah of course of yeah. course you, you don't go back far enough Harry no I don't I sadly don't but that's why you're here how old are uh, you anyway <laughs> how old am I how old do you yeah. think I am 14. <laughs> 14 oh come on come on i am i am 24 are you um, there you go i was nearly right yeah you're 10 years <laughs> out but you know the bit if i didn't have a beard i would look 14 years old uh, i'll tell you so, what if you were 10 years out with me it wouldn't make any bleeding difference <laughs> one way or the other <laughs> <laughs> right come on let's let's let me steer this back on track where were we um vinales oh yeah um anyway <laughs> let me try and call that back um at, well let's just let's see this off vinales has signed uh, an annual contract with an option for renewal he will go up alongside uh his former suzuki teammate alicia spargo so should we just sort of finish this up with uh with that vinales rejoining Aleish, Keith, that's going to be a good thing. They've got good history together. <laughs> 